Yes, happy Easter, happy Resurrection Day. How exciting is this? This is cool, right? Really quickly, um, we're going to play our first song, but we, we do want to encourage you guys to make sure you squeeze in because people are going to keep on coming in. Uh, make sure you have your cell phones silent. Uh, we're we're going to have a, a great time. Let's close our eyes and pray. Lord, we just, uh, we drown out everything from whatever's going on in our lives. We give it all to you. We lay it all down at your feet, um, just in front of you, God. We want to open ourselves up to what you want to do today as we celebrate your resurrection, as we celebrate the fact that you're alive. You are so worthy of our entire life, and we give that to you. And we pray and we ask, God, that you would lead us to you, that you'd lead us by your Holy Spirit. You'd come and fill this room right now and fill our hearts right now and lead us to you. And as we will sing, our hearts cry, Lord, forever we will, we will pursue you, forever with our lives. We will pursue you with all of our lives. Be here powerfully by your Holy Spirit. We know that you're real. We know that you're alive. That's the reason we're here. That's the reason we celebrate today is because you're alive. We love you so much, God. Come be with us as we worship you. In your name. cry, this is our prayer, Lord, to you, that you would lead us by your spirit, and we would pursue you with all of our lives. i 
Spirit would do what you always do, would be faithful. Come and be with us powerfully. We want to lift your name high, higher than any other name, the name of Jesus. That's what we do this morning, God.
the early church would greet each other on Resurrection Sunday, one would say, he is risen, and the response would be? We can do better than that. He is risen. He is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Let's continue to worship the Lord together.
Jesus, our Savior. I believe in God, our Father. I believe in Christ, the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. Christ alone, who took on flesh. 
is risen. He is risen. Okay, now, be, but before you sit down, I have to do it. It's a narrow one, but we got to do it. You got to do the Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday wave. We got to get it right now. You ready over here? Here you go. Ready? Go. And then back. Start here. Start here. And go back. The ones that did not participate last time, here you go. One more time. Ready? Go. And back. And on the count of three, hallelujah, one, two, three, hallelujah, yeah. <laughs> Say hello to someone and find your seat again. Thank you to all the Mahaffey, not only employees, but volunteers who are helping us out on Easter Sunday. Thank you to Extreme Angles Productions and uh, the crew that came with their Extreme Angels, Angles Productions. And uh, we are live streaming. And so shout out, I got to say shout out to my friend Shannon Tanner in Colorado. God bless you, Tanner. Shannon Tanner. Um, we have regular service times in a new location now. I don't know if you're aware of that, but we're starting a Saturday night service at our new location, 3800 17th Avenue North. And even with the Saturday night uh, service, and there is no child care for that particular service right now. So we're especially looking for those of you whose children are extremely behaved uh, or, or are older, all right? Uh, we will, I'm sure, have child care eventually, but the challenge is with all the people here, with the place we're at, even with the Saturday night service, um, we're going to be really full. Uh, so, so, no, look. I don't know why Jesus did it, but sometimes he would do something incredible and he would say, now don't tell anybody. So, we got to see how full we're going to be. So, until we know how full we're going to be, don't tell anybody else. <laughs> all right? <laughs> yeah, crazy, huh? We talked this morning at the sunrise service about death, darkness, and resurrection. And the key text was from Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, where a woman who had had an issue of blood for 12 years and had become in the Old Testament economy under the law, unclean. Uh, if she had been married, she probably was divorced. If she had children uh, in that culture because of her uncleanness, they probably had no contact with her. Uh, it said she had spent all she had on doctors, and yet the doctors couldn't help her. And she was totally destitute, and she came to Jesus. But she came in the midst of a crowd. And her coming was also tied in with a synagogue ruler named Jairus, whose daughter, who happened to be 12 years old, interesting common denominator in the story, the woman, 12 issues of uh, uncleanness, Jairus's daughter, 12 years old, she's dying. Jairus comes to Jesus. Um, he obviously had gone to doctors, and they had finally said, there's nothing more we can do to your daughter. He had heard about Jesus. Usually synagogue rulers would not have been um, partial to Jesus, but when your daughter is dying, you change. You've heard that Jesus heals, and so you come, and he comes, and he, he begs Jesus, come, my daughter is dying. Jesus goes with him. But there's a crowd, and it's slow going. It's like going uh, in ambulance, going you know, in traffic, trying to get to the person that has the need, and it's Jairus' daughter. And in the midst of this, this woman manages to get through the crowd. She knows if she's made public, people will push her away or at least tell her to get away. They don't want to touch her because she's unclean. 
but she has this faith that if she just touches the hem of Jesus' garment, she'll be cleansed. She does. She is. Jesus, knowing that power has gone out from him, uh, pauses in the midst of this crushing crowd around him. And he won't give up until this woman comes through the crowd and confesses that she's the one because he has healed her in response to her faith. Jairus, this father, no doubt is <laughs> distraught as Jesus looks down and says to the woman, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go and be freed from your life of suffering. Jairus, while I'm sure he's happy for the woman, his daughter's dying. And in the midst of Jesus saying those words, daughter, your faith has healed you. Messengers come from the synagogue ruler's house. And they have some really bad news for Jairus, his father. Your daughter's dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? And Jesus, ignoring what they said, turns to Jairus and personally says, literally what he said was, don't be afraid. Keep on believing. He had faith in Jesus that, Jesus could heal his daughter. But now he needed to have faith because his daughter is dead. Now he needed to have faith beyond the grave. Faith not in the healing power of Jesus, faith in the resurrecting power of Jesus. I read this morning, and, and you're hearing a bit of the message, so you ought to be happy if you didn't make it to the sunrise service. You didn't have to get up early and come. You're hearing some of it right now. I read this great statement in a book that a fellow gave me a few weeks ago, a friend of mine called The Divine Visitor about Jesus coming to earth, and it says this, death is a process of disruptive intrusion into God's original order. Set in motion the moment we take our first breath. By reason of man's fall, his sin, life has become a relentless process of decay. A fundamental hopelessness resides within most of mankind because of this penalty of man's sin. Death comes in everyday circumstances and events of our living. Visions die. Health decays. Hopes and dreams fade. Relationships wither and often die. A lifetime of dying confronts every person. And we learned this morning at the sunrise service that death, death is more than physical. We also learned that death's cousin, darkness, is more than physical darkness. And death and darkness are tied together. And we live in a world filled with darkness and filled with death. But Jesus came that we might have hope in a dark world. Isaiah prophesies there'll be no more gloom for those living in distress. In the future, he'll honor Galilee of the Gentiles. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. John's Gospel, chapter 1, tells us that he is the light. He's the life. He's the light. Darkness is anything and everything that's wrong with this world, including death, but not just only death. Point to ponder for you Bible students. In Genesis chapter 1, when God records His creation of the world and the universe and all the galaxies, it's interesting that He created light before he created the sun, moon, and the stars. That's fascinating. That's mysterious. There's light, and there's darkness, and Jesus has come so that every person might have the opportunity to see the light and escape the darkness, and there's the rub. What do you mean? John's Gospel, chapter 3.
John's Gospel, chapter 3. Even if you've never read the Bible, you might know this opening verse I will share in John chapter 3. You find it in verse 16. It goes like this. For God so loved the world. He so loved the world, the world of darkness and death. He so loved the world, the people, that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. A lot of people know that verse, but you know what comes after that verse? Here's what comes right after that verse. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. Pause and think about that one just for a minute. Because some people think that's why He came. He came, He came to send you to hell. <laughs> no, no, he, he didn't come for that. He didn't come to condemn you. He didn't come to condemn me. And we got religious people unfortunately, sometimes giving God a, a, a bad rap because all you feel from them is condemn. Listen, the people that felt the most comfortable around Jesus were the people who knew they needed help. He did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he does not believe in the name of God's one and only Son. And here's the key verse, verse 19, the next verse. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. Jesus. But men love darkness instead of light. Because their deeds were evil. I don't know how much you know about yourself. We're in bad shape. Because <laughs> here, here's what we believe. We believe sometimes that the darkness is light. We like the darkness. Let me explain what I mean. There's a story in Luke's gospel that illustrates this very point, I think, perfectly. You find it in Luke's gospel, chapter 15, and it goes like this. I'm just going to read the story for you. Verse 11, Jesus speaking, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. And he becomes known in Christian circles, in church circles now, in this story as the prodigal son, the wandering wayward son. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went, and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, and that's where you need to come. Come to your senses. He said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll sit out and I'll go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me white like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The literal is he smothered him with kisses. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And before he can say, Dad, just make me one of your slaves. The father said to the servant, Hey, quick, hey, kill the fattened calf. Get the band. We're having a party. 
Bring the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. Sand on us on his feet. Bring the fattened calf. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead. He was dead. He's alive again. He was lost, and he's found. So they began to celebrate. I mean, they threw a party. (laughs) Man, man, does that story get straight? God's heart and why Jesus came. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, Jesus. Whosoever would believe in Him should not perish in the darkness by death. He was dead in sin. Ephesians 2, you were dead in your sins and transgressions. Dead. He was lost. Because he took a wrong turn. All of us have taken a wrong turn. Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. He came to his senses in the pig pen. But but wait a minute. Let's back up. Let me back up just for a minute. Let's get an image of this, this, this prodigal son when he first leaves home. Now, The story doesn't tell us how long before he ended up in the pig pen. But I think it was a while. Because I think his father, being a wealthy guy, I think he left left with a bankroll. And this dude, man, when he finally gets away from home, here's what I thought about. I can't help it. I couldn't help but think about it. I thought about when I was 15 years old, and in those days in South Carolina, you could get your license at 15, your driver's license. I remember the day I drove away from the house all by myself in my stepfather's Opal Cadet. And despite the fact that it was an Opal Cadet, it was an exciting day. Man, four speed, here I am. And it wasn't very fast, but I mean, I'm free. I am free. I can go anywhere I want. I can play any kind of music on the radio I want. If it had an eight track player, I would have put in an eight track that I loved. I'll explain it later for the younger crowd. I don't know if you've discovered, but the freedom that we think is freedom is not really freedom. Oh, you enjoy it for a period of time. And I just went from one, one belief of freedom to the next until ultimately, well, before I, before I tell you that, look, I like going to concerts. I love going to concerts. I love music. Uh, I'm an old rock and roll drummer, self-taught, you know, and uh, I, I, I like going to concerts, and most of the concerts I go to are from my generation. Now, there's a real challenge with that uh, when you get to be 61, uh, because in my generation, the guys that were playing the music are already older than me, so at 61, they're much older than me, and most of them are dead. And so the concert, uh, the concert list is, is decreasing. Because these guys are dying. But I went not too long ago to see um, the Guess Who at Epcot Center right there in Orlando. And I read an article because I wanted to make sure that at least one original member is with them. Because if it's not at least one original member, it's just not the same. So I read that two members, two original members of the Guess Who were, were still traveling. And one of them for sure would be with them. And so I thought, this is great. I got my wife, talked her into it, and she said, we're going to see who? I said, the guess who? She said, who? I said, the guess who? And we go, and I get a good seat there at Epcot Center, and I'm waiting, and I'm so excited to see the guess who. And I mean, they bounced out on the stage, and I was immediately disappointed because these guys got to be in their 20s. I'm looking for the old guy, the old original guy, and he just doesn't there. He never shows up. 
But I stayed. I stayed. And we got, they got to the end of that final song, and usually the final song was their biggest hit. And, I, and then for the old geezers here, what was the biggest hit of the guess who? American Woman. And they started playing American Woman. And here's what happened. Here's what happened. You saw these people get up. Some had dumped in their wheelchairs. And there, 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 there. American Woman, get away from me. American woman, and I mean, they're just getting into it. Now, you got to understand, I'm not one of those old people, but I, you know, I go to these concerts and these people are there. And you want to go to one with really old people, go see Peter Noon and the Herman's Hermits. I watch these people, I, and, and, and they, they start to act like they're in high school again. And what happens is, what happens is, especially on certain songs they play, you all of a sudden are transported back in time. And you're with that girl. Now, you can't think about her now because she's long gone. You married somebody else. Guess who's uh, at Epcot this next week? Foghat. Oh, man. I think I'm going to have to go. But I, I, got, I don't know if are any of these guys still alive. But, I mean, some of their songs, boy, does that take me back in time. They, back in time when I was, man, I had, some, I had some great, great times. I mean, I played in a band with a guy named Frankie Tyson. Frankie Tyson was one of the best bass players at 17 years old I have ever heard. And Foghat, slow ride. I mean, it just, I mean. You're just transported back in time. And sometimes if you're not careful, if you're not careful, you'll go, man, those were the good old days. What? Wait, <laughs> wait, When that happens, at least for me, I go, hey, 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 wake up, will you? Wake up. I went to some great parties. I went to some great concerts. Uh, you know, and if I was a few years ago going to see the Guess Who, uh, before I arrived, I would have rolled some nice uh, handmade cigarettes. And we would have partied. I became a drug addict. And at one point, at one period of my life, I thought I had everything in the world that could make me happy. And I found out it was a lie. The darkness lies. <laughs> the darkness appears to be light, and you go, man, yeah, that's it right there. And that's what happened to this prodigal when he first left home. He's like, yeah, man, I can listen to whatever I want to listen to. I can go wherever I want to go. I do whatever I want to do. And you keep going that path. And hopefully, hopefully, you come to the place that you realize there is nothing in this world that will give you what you need and what you really want. Paradise, that's where God originally put man. Did you know that? This is the kind of God I serve. He, he created man, and he put him in paradise. He don't want us to live in a shack for eternity. And he doesn't want us to live in darkness and gloom and, and face death. No, he has a plan. He always had a plan. His plan, for God so loved the world. A world of darkness, a world of death. But Jesus came that we might have life and hope. And the story at sunrise, Jairus' daughter, 12 years he was blessed. And then the tragedy of his life hit, and he ran for healing to Jesus, but his daughter died, and now he has to trust Jesus beyond this life. And the woman, 12 years of suffering, after evidently being blessed before that. We don't know her life before that, but she obviously was blessed before that. 
in this life, God sometimes He doesn't make it happen. He doesn't make it happen. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. But 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 He'll He'll say, okay, if that's where you if that's where you think life is, and you go, you go like the prodigal son. But hopefully, you come to the place in life you realize this is just a pig pen. And when you come to your senses, you say, what in the world am I doing? What am I doing? And you do like this prodigal, and you say, man, I'm just going to go back to my father. I'm going to confess. It's, I, I've gone my own way. I, I'm a rebel at heart, and I, I just want to come back home. And maybe you're here. This is your moment. This is going to make the difference in your life for all of eternity. And God the Father looking down and Jesus saying, I died for you. I love you. I paid the price for your sin. I want you to be washed. I want you to be cleansed. And if you'll say yes to Jesus, here's the great news too. Listen, It's not that you say yes to Jesus and he says, now get your hair cut and stop listening to that music and do this. And, no one go. and, and that's, the, that's the world's view of what religion is. Look, when I, when I found Jesus and, and he saved me, I didn't find religion. I found life. He didn't come to set us. He didn't come to. He didn't come to put us into bondage. He came us to release us. And if you'll just come home to the God who created each one of us and loves each one of us and sent Jesus to die for us, if you'll just come home, <laughs> heaven will say, "Kill the fattened calf, strike up the band, let's have a party." No lecture. No lecture, no, well, look, you did this and you did that and you did that. It's going to take you a while to clean you up. No, 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 no. You don't clean yourself up. Jesus cleans you up. All you have to do is just come to your senses and say, I'm coming home. I want to invite you to do that. I don't always do it the same way. It's 1127. We haven't even been here an hour yet. So we have time to do this. You can receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you can be saved, as the Bible calls it, without doing what I'm going to ask you to do. But I think for many of us, maybe all of us that want to receive Jesus, for right now, this is what you need to do to take that first step. Band's going to come. we got two simple songs, and we're done. And then we're off. Happy Easter. Have a great Easter Sunday. Two more songs. And this first song, I want to invite you to take a public step in receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Jesus hung on a cross publicly, despising the shame of the cross. He was willing to go public for you. Won't you go public for him? No such thing as a Christian incognito. I like to say if you can't confess Jesus Christ publicly in the church service, how are you going to do it when you leave the church service? How are you going to do that? This is your first step of courage and faith. To say, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I don't care what those came with me, those that are sitting with me. I don't care what they think. I care what God thinks. Jesus said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you. Now, before I give you the formal invitation and have you come forward, we started something that I don't know why I didn't do all these years of ministry. That when people give their lives to Christ, if you'll just give us your contact information, and the only reason we want it, we're not, going, we're not sending you a letter asking you for money. We're not sending you a bunch of emails and stuff. We just want to invite you, if you're making a decision today to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, in a couple of weeks, and if you'll give us your contact, we'll give you all the details. In a couple of weeks, on a Thursday night, we're having what we call a New Believer's Dinner. And it's just that, a dinner. 
And, we're, and the only reason for the dinner is just to have dinner. We just want to get to know you. Welcome you to the family of God. My wife and I will be hosting it, some of the other people in our church, but we wanted to be more intimate, you know, just hang out at a dinner together. Unless, of course, 100 people get saved here today, and that will be a big dinner. But that's okay. That's okay. I don't mind big dinners. So we have some decision cards. They are on each corner. There are also some at the prayer tent. So if you don't have time to fill out a a decision card down here, you can grab one at the prayer tent, either fill it out there, take it with you, bring it back to church, or send it through snail mail to us, however you want to do it, or email, email. But if you'd like to physically go ahead and give us your contact, and then we'll send you the information, invite you to the new believer's dinner in a couple of weeks. We'd love to have dinner with you. If you'd like to receive Jesus. Now, I'm going to add something else. I don't want it to be confusing. That's why I'm taking my time. You're going to receive Christ, and then you're going to publicly come while we sing this one song, and then I'm going to have prayer with all the new believers and those others that come. Here's the others that I believe need to come. You're already a Christian. You don't doubt that you really have a, you have faith in Jesus and you've been what the Bible calls born again. But you've walked away. As a Christian, you've walked away. And you need to make a fresh commitment to Jesus Christ. And whatever it is in your life that you know you need to get right, and to stop whatever habit it is or stop whatever lifestyle it is, you're saying, you know what, today's the day. I'm going to get back to my full commitment. I'm going to commit my life again to Jesus Christ. Because if you're really a Christian, you have no peace living the way you're living. You have no real joy the way, the way you're living. The only way you're going to get that peace back, the only way you're going to get that joy back, the only way you're going to get the fellowship of the Lord back is to say, I'm making a fresh commitment. I'm going to change some things in my life. I'm coming back home. So come, some coming for the first time, and then some coming as Christians saying, I'm coming, and I'd like you to just pray for me as I make a fresh commitment to Jesus Christ. Bow with me. If you're receiving Christ, pray from your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Forgive me. Come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Help me to live for you now the rest of this life. If you're a Christian, and you just tell him right now, Lord, I'm sorry. I want to come back. I want to recommit my life to you. Help me to live for you now. Help me, Lord. As we sing this song, while others are seated, I want you to slip out. People will let you by. They will let you by. I love what Billy Graham used to say, if you're in the balcony, we'll wait for you. And you're coming because you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ, and you're saying, I want to publicly commit my life to Christ. Oh, you're a Christian. You're coming back to a right relationship with Jesus. And I'm going to stand right here on the front of the stage while we sing, while you come. Come. Do what the Lord's telling you to do. Come on. Come on. As we sing.
Thank you, Lord. You made a decision to come and to give your life so that we might have life. And I pray for those that have come now and made a decision to give their life, to have your life, eternal life, everlasting life. I pray, Lord, that you would grant them the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that they would come to know you better and better and better, that they would grow in their walk with you and in their faith. I pray, Lord, for those who have come back to a right relationship with you, Jesus. May you strengthen them. May you restore that joy and fellowship and peace they once had with you. May you help them to live lives that are pleasing to you. Lord, go before now these, your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's a bold, bold step. Grab a decision card. Grab a decision card. One last song all together. Let's give it up for Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah.
Happy Resurrection Day to you guys. We love you. God bless you. And we will see you next week. Have a great Resurrection Day.